so that those can watch afterwards. So welcome. This is Beyond the Syllabus, Relationship Builders for the New School Year. If you're just joining us, if you'd like to share in the chat who your favorite teacher was and why, I'd love to hear it. Um, while you think about that, I'm going to share a little bit about mine. So my favorite teacher was Mrs. Lewis. She always did things in her classroom to build relationships. She was my second grade teacher. And as silly as it sounds, one of the things that she did was sing a new sh shoe song um, when we came with new shoes. And I always felt so different because I had larger feet than my peers. And so she sang the new shoe song twice when we came um, with when I came with new shoes because she wanted me to feel included and it made me feel so special. So I'd love for you to just take a second, share in the chat if you feel comfortable. If you don't, um, I'll just give you a minute to reflect on your own and then we'll get started. Really wonderful. Um, if you didn't have a chance to stare in the chat or you're still typing, um, I'll definitely come back and pause as those come in. Or if you're commuting and you aren't able to, that's totally fine. Just take a second to reflect on your own. All right. So um, I've already hit record. These are available to watch afterwards. So know that if you talk or you have a question or things like that, um, that they will be available for others. I can see now in the chat, we have a couple of favorite teachers coming in. Um, we had one about their high school English teacher that was so kind and never forgot her sitting down to help me and giving me a Jolly Rancher. Oh, how special. Thanks for being willing to share that. Yeah, I I really think that relationships are the foundation for teaching anything. And so I'm excited to learn about and talk about that today. Um, here are professional development norms. Thank you so much for sharing again. Um, today, I'd like you to just take a moment and think about a norm that you'd like to focus on. Um, those norms are to be committed, be a learner, and commit to implementing strategies, be responsible, actively participate by engaging and collaborating, be respectful, allow others to listen and to speak, and use technology for the task at hand, be safe, take care of your needs, ask clarifying questions, and respect all ideas. So if you want to take a second to think about a norm that you'd like to focus on today, you don't need to put it in the chat, but I'll give you about 30 seconds just so you can select one from the slide. Wonderful. Hopefully you've had a second to select one of those and that commit to that as we go through this today. Um, just some professional development norms. Um, please mute your microphone. This helps focus our presentation. If you're comfortable, you're welcome to turn on your camera. Um, you can blow your background if you like. It's not required. You can leave it off if you'd like to. Um, if you have a question or comment, please type it in the chat. I'd love to answer your questions and share your stories um, and honor that experience that you have. So just know that those are some of our protocols as we go through today. Um, and just glad that you're here. So thanks for being here. Our learning intention today is to explain why relationship building is important and create a plan to use a relationship building strategy in your classroom. Um, our success criteria is that by the end, you can select a strategy to use and create a plan to use it. So that's where we're headed. This is our goal. And by the end, we'll have a strategy that you can use. Um, just as a brief introduction, my name is Emma Moss. I'm a teacher specialist in Canyon School District, and I work in the digital teaching and learning team. I'm part of the instructional supports department, and I just love helping teachers. And so I'm excited. I'm new to this role but have a lot of things that hopefully I can share and help you as we go through today. So that's a little bit about me. If you have questions afterwards at all, that's my email address. Feel free to send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love your feedback, anything that you have to share. Here's kind of our plan. I know we started a couple minutes late, but I wanted to make sure in case people were joining, I've, I've been in that predicament before. I'm like, oh, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. So don't even worry. Um, we've done our norms and our agenda items. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about, about why relationships matter, just quick five minutes. And then I'm going to go through those strategies, 15 strategies in about 15 minutes. 
um, and then wrap up and resources. So we should be here 30 minutes or less. If you at any time have to jump off, I totally understand because you have other commitments, but I'd love for you to stay the whole time and learn with us. So before we get started, I just want to talk about why relationships matter. Um, this is with John Hattie. There's some research he did of a meta-analysis of a whole bunch of studies and looked at what were the most effective strategies. And what he found is that at 0.4 in his measurements, that that was the average effect size. So if it was an average strategy, it had a year's growth or 0.4. Teacher-student relationships have a 0.52 impact, which means they produce more than a year's growth when you make those relationships in your classroom as well as that teacher credibility. So students trusting you and having that relationship of trust with you had a 0 0.9 impact, which is huge. It's like double a year's worth of growth because a student trusts you. So take a second in the chat. I want to know a little bit about your experience. Um, a K, how do you build teacher credibility or a W, well, a KWL format here. What is something that you want to know about this topic? So take just about a minute. You can pick a K, a W, or you can do both if you want. Um, and we'll take one minute just to uh, wrap that and let you share your thoughts. About 30 more seconds if you're still wrapping up. Um, I love the strategy that was shared in the chat um, that while students are working, they teach a careers class. And um, it lends themselves to naturally asking what students are interested in, which I think is awesome. Like interest in careers, great pairing. Um, walk around the classroom and ask them questions. To them. I love that. I, I really think that those one-on-one -on -one interactions and experiences that you can share are really powerful for students because even though there's a lot of students in the classroom, you can connect in ways that you may not connect otherwise. So thanks for taking a chance to, to share that with us today. Um, this is just some more information on why um, why relationships matter. Uh, this is from an article in the New York Times called Students Learn from People They Love. Um, and I love that there was this study done at the University of Washington that shows that the social brain pervades every learning process. So they gave an infant's Chinese lessons, whether they spoke Chinese or not. And infants took face-to-face -face lessons with the tutor. Their social brain was activated. Others watched through a video and they didn't learn as much because um, they weren't interacting in a social way. And so that's part of the reason like why on Zoom meetings we have like interact with the chat or talk to each other is because it activates that social nature, which I think is really neat. Um, they also found then this study done in New York University that the student brain actually synchronizes with the teacher's brain activity. So the excitement that you show, the connections that you build actually help to co-regulate and work with your classroom, which I think is fascinating. Um, there is also um, a quote from ASCD about that educators and communities that were inclusive and created psychological safety um, weathered the storm of the pandemic a bit easier. So um, those that had relationships and were able to build those with students um, did better, which shouldn't be surprising as an educator. All right, so we've talked a little bit about this. In your opinion, why is relationship building important? So our learning intention talked about to explain why. So let's just do a quick check. You can share what you learned or something you know about why it's important. While those of you that are here are typing, I just want to share a quick experience. Um, for me, I feel like relationships are anything, um, is like the most important thing you can do in a classroom because they provide that foundation for everything else that you do. And so um, I had a student once that I didn't know them very well and I spent time getting to know them and I learned that they loved to build things. And so um, they ended up 
in one of my classes building me a headphone rack, which was really cool. Um, but it didn't start that way. They started as just in my classroom. It was one of the students I really struggled with. Um, but as I built the relationship, they ended up being my teaching assistant. And then they built that headphone rack for me. And it was um, such a powerful thing to work with that student and help them feel included. And then um, I used to teach middle school. And so that student went on into a pathway where they were doing woodworking and building things and um, kind of discovered that that was an option in education. And so um, I wouldn't have known that without the relationship, which I think is really impactful. So um, hopefully I had a chance to share or reflect. Um, that's kind of our intro information. We're done with our five minutes. Um, but I want to go over those strategies because that's where you're here, right? The hands-on, what can I apply to my classroom? So I just wanted to briefly cover what will you see? You're going to see resources, um, descriptions for reference, um, planning time. I tried to include all of those um, to make sure that you had a place to be like, yes, I can do this, this, or this. Um, this presentation will be available for you after. Um, it will be linked in the same place as video is. So if you want to go back and reference, um, I did say 15 strategies in 15 minutes. So know that they'll be a little fast, but about halfway through, I'll give us a chance to pause. Um, I love that you're sharing things about relationship building, especially in the chat that you talked about happiness in your classroom, that the students feed off each other. Yes, exactly. Um, they definitely do. So Hopefully these strategies help you build some of that happiness. Um, they're some of the ones that I used in my classroom and they'll help you. So um, our first strategy is this one called, what's a name, name tents. You've probably seen this before. Um, it asks students to create a name tent that introduces, that includes a pronunciation guide, why they have their name or why they like it. Um, the research behind this is that students' perception of encouragement and satisfaction with lecture care um, with the use of the given name and English skills, um, when students believed instructors learned and you instructors learned and used their given name in class. So especially for our multilingual learners, this can be really helpful. Um, just as you're practicing, um, one of the things that I would always say to my students, what I say is really important for me to know how to say your name. So you're going to correct me as much as you need to. And so it's a quick thing that you can add um, to those name tents. This is an avid strategy um, about that pronunciation or have them share about why they have their name um, because it's important to them. It's the name that they go by. So that's strategy number one, quick, but we're gonna go to the next one. And like I said, we're gonna pause about halfway through. This next strategy is called find somebody who. So it's a bingo type game. You can set up a table or a card. Um, I have a template available for you from the slides link and you can have and edit that card however you'd like. And it's things in your classroom that you want them to find. At the beginning of the year, I would use this for how to like connect with someone, like um, things in common, finding common ground. Whereas like I'd start to use it in different ways. Like I used it once for um, like this one is for procedures, find somebody who knows where you should turn in homework. I'd have the students sign their names. So what it'd be is my students would have five minutes and they'd all be walking around and being like, my name is John. And what's your name? And they'd be like, my name is um, Sophia. What's your name? And um, what what's something that you do? And they trade papers and talk to each other and establishing that protocol is really helpful. It does take a little bit more planning time than the name tent. So this is a medium planning time, but totally worth it. Really fun. Get students out of their seats with movement. Their second strategy. All right. This is our third strategy. This is a four corners. Um, non it's non-academic if you're building relationships but you can do it academically. You can play a game of four corners that helps your students get to know you through questions or finding commonalities. So this is an example of a slide. Which one are you? Are you an only child, a youngest child, an oldest child, a middlest child? Um, so let's just check in with the people that are here. Which one are you? Are you a one only child, two youngest child, three oldest child, or four middle child? Put a number in the chat. You're a two, you are the youngest child. I'm also a two, I am a youngest child as well. So um, yeah, wherever you fall, it's really fun to see the dynamics of your class that way. Um, you can also use this to kind of learn like their interests. So um, in my digital literacy class that I taught, I, I knew I had specific places I could go for virtual reality. And so I would ask if you could go in the world and I put those four up there. And then I'd see which classes said what was their favorite. So I kind of used it as a formative assessment. So then later in the year when I used that, everyone was like, wow, that's my favorite. And it was like, 
yeah, because I learned that information from here. So great strategy, really adaptable. Um, strategy number four, this is called That's Me. So what you do is you provide descriptions of various things that could describe a student, like an only child or likes chocolate. Um, and when they apply to a student, have them yell, that's me. Um, and this helps them see what students have things in common. So like this one I would display, it says, is this you? And I like to read. And I would have like 10 students be like, that's me. Um, tip for this one as you're implementing, know that you should have things that most students will have in common um, starting out and then go to things that maybe would be a little less common. So for example, um, might say like, I'm a middle school student and everyone would say, that's me. Um, I'm in this grade level. So like when I dip my digital literacy classes, I'm in eighth grade and they would say, that's me. Um, doing those broad ones first creates that psychological safety to where when you get to things to more specifically, like I had one that was like, I like Star Wars <laughs> and it would only be like maybe a handful of kids. They were so used to yelling that then it help them find those commonalities. Um, this one is super low prep time. Um, there's a template here for you. And yes, psychological safety is really important when doing these things. So um, really low prep time, couple of questions, but just something to think about as you're preparing. All right, five, we're third of the way through. Uh, this one I call rapid fire questions. Um, I use it as part of a student spotlight. So I have students decide between two choices of what they like, um, like M&Ms or Skittles, and I just included it as this half sheet. So um, what would happen is I would have them do um, that, and then I could just fold it in half, and then I would have them write their name on the inside of the paper. So then I wouldn't know either. Um, and it's just fun to see really quickly about them, what do they like, and then the students would all be guessing. Um, Pro tip on this one, make sure that you have enough space to do all of your students. So if you do it, make sure you're not just highlighting like five. I use this in advisory and it was such a great hands-on way to get to know that smaller group of kids, but you can change some of the questions um, to like the Pop-Tarts Pop -Tarts or cereal one. Um, there was a time once a term that I would bring in Pop-Tarts or cereal based on what they said. So uh, ways to get to know your students and super quick, um, takes like five minutes because they're fast questions. So. All right, strategy number six, this is a two by 10 strategy. This does take a little bit more planning time, but you can spend two minutes each day for 10 days talking up with a student about anything they'd like to talk to you about. Um, this takes planning in the fact that I tried to specifically pick who those two students were. Um, oftentimes these were students that maybe um, I noticed weren't interacting with a lot of friends in the classroom, um, maybe you didn't have like a super positive response to the subject. When I taught history, I always had kids that were like, I hate history. Those are the kids that I would go talk to, to try and help them engage a little bit better. Um, the research on this is amazing. 85% improvement in one student's behavior. In addition, he found that the behavior of all the other students in the class improved as well. Um, so I would just put on a rotation, like I'm going to pick these two students for the next 10 days, um, for those two weeks. And it was really manageable. I used it in my like starter time or if you have a time when they're working on um, the classroom and I would just put their initials on my desk. That way it wasn't displayed anywhere. It wasn't something students knew, but I was aware of who I was talking to in that class period. So like I said, takes a little bit more planning, um, but totally worth it. All right, seven, almost halfway through. Um, this is something I call Dice Day. Um, it's positive reinforcement. So it's a PBIS. Um, class contingency. So what I would do is I'd pick a day as a designated dice day. Um, and then I would give out red or green pebbles based on the group behavior for that group contingency. So like if everyone was on task during their start time, I'd be like, we're doing so great. I'm putting green ones in the jar. Um, and then on a designated day, I would shake their jar with whatever they had and pull out a pebble. If it was green, then I would roll the dice for a pre-numbered prize. And if it was red, I'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry. We'll try again. Um, tried really hard at the beginning of the year to give lots of positive feedback for things. Wow. I noticed that table group, I had mine as social media. So my Snapchat table over here is doing a phenomenal job with this. They earned a green one. Um, students of teachers who boosted their ratio of, to five positive comments and interactions for every negative one had significantly less disruptive behavior, which is like amazing. So that's what I tried to do. It helped me have a visual way too, to see like, 
oh, wow, I've given that class maybe more negative feedback. I'm going to focus on positive feedback there. Um, and the rewards were so really simple. So like this one, I have choose your own seats for a day. Um, I brought in creamies, apparently. Um, we used to have Patriot bucks. Um, you can do things that are absolutely non-food rewards. Um, things like um, having choosing the brain break, I would use a brain break. Um, or um, having five minutes of free time or... Um, I know one of the teachers across the hall uses the strategy and he took his kids out to play um, Frisbee outside. Um, just depends on what you're comfortable with as a teacher. And that's what I would say. Whatever you do, make sure that you're committed because if it, you, kids roll and then you don't bring it, it's like the relationship ender. So just make sure you're committed. They can be small things, big things. Um, Try to space them a little bit more together at the beginning of the year so they would get that reinforcement and then space them out a little bit more as the semester of the year went on. All right. This is strategy eight. And I think right after this, we have our break. So like I said, no, it's fast, but I want to give you like hands-on applicable strategies. So um, this one is called a superhero check-in. So you have students fill out about themselves as a superhero answering the questions about their weaknesses, strengths, and superpower. If you want, you can have them share with a partner, tell students you're going to do this if you're doing that. Again, psychological safety um, doesn't take very long. Um, I have the slide for you already made, but... I have them pick up like a half sheet and then have them draw or explain. So it gives students options. If we're looking at like universal design for learning, they can write it, they can draw it. I've gotten some really cute pictures from this, um, but it kind of tells you what students are struggling with um, or their strengths and it can be in anything. Um, when I've done this, I start this at the beginning of the year and have it be very like whatever you want. And then sometimes I'll structure it as like, hey, we're going to do a superhero check-in about writing. So um, I used to teach Utah studies as well. And um, in that class, I would be like, hey, we're going to check in on our writing. What's your weaknesses as a super writer? Or what's your strengths as a super writer? And I could use it as a formative assessment that way. So um, a lot of these are things that you can build as a routine your students will be used to. And so hopefully that helps. All right, we're halfway through. So we're going to pause. Um, because we are like creating a plan to use a relationship building in your classroom from the eight that we've shared, what has been your favorite so far? Or if you're like, Emma, I don't like any of these, <laughs> then you can put in what is one of your favorite strategies for building relationships. If you're watching this afterwards, uh, feel free to pause this and kind of like jot down your thoughts, go back, reference the slides, but what has been your favorite strategy or what's one that you use? So let's just take about a minute, kind of debrief all of those eight great strategies that we just heard of um, and type what you think. You got 15 more seconds, kind of wrap up your thoughts. Okay. Um, so in chat, saying they like the rapid fire questions. Love that one. I think um, my personal favorite is the superhero check-in just because I'm a little bit quirky, but um, love that. Hopefully you have a second to just kind of debrief um, with that and see where you're at. So we're halfway through. We have about seven more and we're just going to run through those again real quick. So um, this next strategy is called 30 second me. Um, you give each student a post-it note and give them 30 seconds to draw themselves or you. Um, once finished, you collect them and hang them somewhere in the classroom. Um, you can do, like I said, you can do you as well. So this is ones that I had when they did me. Um, it's really funny. This is me with a photon blaster. I didn't actually have one of those in the classroom, but the kid, um, I kind of asked him to explain it. And he was like, it's because you would like do anything to help us. And I was like, okay, that's positive. This is good. Um, but super fun. 30, 30 seconds. You just tell them like, Hey, like this is not 
I don't want it. I don't need to see how you're drawing. Like it's just a fast thing. Um, and it kind of puts them on a level playing field and it's fun to do it with them. Cause you can display it. If you're going to display it, tell them, just be like, I'm going to hang it. Um, in my classroom, I just had a space, um, over by my desk where I hung each year's post-it notes. And so then when I sat by my desk, I could look over and be like, Oh, that's Julie. And it kind of reminded me of them without hanging pictures and things and made sure I was thinking of them. So super fun, quick thing to do. Take some post-it notes. Um, there's a great resource here on shared ownership in the classroom. If you have extra time to go. Um, all right, next strategy. These are one pagers. So if you have students, um, create a one pager about themselves, include things like their name, favorite hobby, favorite movie. Um, I like this one favorite word. It's interesting to see what they put. Um, and you can also display these. They do take a little bit more time. Um, but it's a great thing to do at the beginning of the year. I would always use this and say, hey, we're going to take this time in class, but they aren't due for another week. So, and I'll make sure that you have extra space. So as I finished, I knew my lesson sometimes took a little less time or more time. I'd be like, okay, pull out your one pager. We're going to keep working on those. So it kind of gave me a space to let students have an extra thing that they were always working through at the beginning of the year before we really dived into content. Um, and it's fun to see them and see the time that they put into them. Um, the student named Jane, clearly she loved drawing. I, um, she asked if she could connect it with Vines and had so much fun doing that. Um, so just know it's a really handy strategy. Medium prep, not too crazy. All right. Um, this next one is called Blob It. <laughs> My students love this. It does get a little intense, but it's really low prep. And it has resulted in so many giggles in my classroom. So um, have students, you, have, you play some music, you have them walk around or the music is playing. Um, and then you pause the music and give them a category. So I might say like blob tennis shoes or types of shoes or blob by shirt color or um, blob um, by favorite color. And so then I'll be like, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite color? And they're all trying to blob. Um, and it's fun to see and find connections. So I just want you to imagine a group of like 38th graders being like, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite color? And then seeing how they blob. And it's really um, engaging and fun for them and makes them feel included because they have someone to blob with. Um, or sometimes I'll give them specific subjects like blob, whether your sub favorite subject is math or science. And so then they'll be like, whoop, and they'll block to two sides of the room um, really quickly and really fun and lots of laughs in this one. So um, I used it as a brain break in my classroom. Um, this study in 2016, which I know is a little bit older, found it was more effective to give several 10 minute lessons instead of fewer 30 minute lessons. Um, I have two here linked in the slides, my brain breaks list. So this is something that I made, but it has a low prep. And then like the amount of control, because I know wherever you're at as a teacher with brain breaks, you got to do them in a way that feels comfortable for you. So um, that'll be there for you if you'd like it. All right. Next one is strategy 12. So I only have like a couple more to go, like four. Um, this one is student affirmations. Um, have students repeating a positive phrase to another student and give them high five. Um, I like this one. It says there's no one better to be than myself. I am enough. Um, John Hattie's research shows that self-efficacy, so that belief in themselves, has a 0 0.92 effect size, so even greater than teacher relationships. Um, but it's really awesome to like be like, okay, turn to your elbow partner. And then as a teacher, you go fill in where there isn't an elbow partner and get to say to a kid, like, you are enough. And be like, high five. Like, it's awesome. It just creates this sense of positivity in the classroom. And especially after you've had something that maybe it's like a little deeper topic. Um, like I remember when I talk about computer functions, it's like something that's a lot of information. Um, I always put up something about being a growth mindset at the end of class. And then they walk away with this positive feeling. It does take a little bit more time. Um, I linked in here 100 affirmations. Go through, use your teacher wisdom to decide what will work best for you. But super fun. All right. This one is called check in with images. So three more to go. Um, this one is hysterical for me because they're so funny, but you display an image rating scale and have students tell you where they're at via an exit ticket, holding up fingers, sharing out, et cetera. Um, it's just fun. I've heard um, this research, social, emotional learning interventions address um, academic forms by 11% points, which is crazy. Um, there's, I linked this Pinterest in, um, link. It has 44 different mood scales that you can use. That's what these are called. Um, but they have everywhere from like SpongeBob to like hedgehog cakes. Um, 
I found these were really helpful, like especially during the pandemic or if you have to do online stuff, um, where are you at? So let's just check in with this one. Where are you at today? Are you a number one SpongeBob or your number nine SpongeBob? Um, I think I'm feeling number five SpongeBob today, but pick a number and throw it in the chat. Or if you're at home watching this after, you can pick a number in your own head. What do you think? Okay, it looks like you're also at a five. Yep. Um, these are fun just to see where your kids are at and really quick exit ticket. You can do it with pretty much any character that they're familiar with. Um, and it makes you relatable. Like my kids are always like, it's SpongeBob. Anyways, they're excited. Low prep, super easy. Um, this is strategy 14, probably one you're already doing, but if you don't, a daily agenda. So you provide an agenda for students to know where they're at in the day. Um, it will look different at each grade level, but um, the research shows that a coherent and clear agenda is crucial because it creates that feeling of safety. Again, we talked about psychological safety. Um, it does take a little bit of time, but totally worth it. I know, especially with my students with anxiety, um, this was really helpful. And I even had kids that were like, could you print the agenda slide beforehand so I can have it on my desk and really helped them manage time um, to know where they were at and how that they had some sense of like, okay, this is what's happening. So it was a little less scary. So if you aren't doing that, great thing to do. Lots of research on that. All right, 15, um, planned parent communication. Um, set up a way to track or plan parent communication. Um, I always made it a point to recognize those students who might not get recognized. So um, I just kept a list. I had a Google Doc um, on my computer of things that I saw students do that I thought were great. And then I would send home those emails. Um, I sent them home once a week because I could set a time for like 40 minutes and then I could just send a whole bunch out um, and said, hey, this week I saw your student do this. Um, I know that teaching has a lot of things going on. Totally recognize that. Um, but this is such a quick way, particularly if you can email positive things home with students that um, maybe you notice at the beginning of the year are starting to struggle or um, maybe are like working really hard to understand content, things like that, that you can notice. Uh, John Hattie's research again, shows that parental involvement has a 0.5 of sex size. So again, over a year's growth takes a little bit of planning, um, but Canyons has great resources for how to plan that. Parent Square also has a back to school checklist of things you could include. Um, and with the integration of Parent Square, every parent has an account. Some of those come to their phones as text messages, which I found is super effective. Um, so great thing to do if you aren't. Okay, so um, that is our 15, if you can believe it, our time's almost up together. Um, but our learning intention was about explaining why relationship building is important, which we checked off at the beginning. We're gonna go ahead and look at that, creating a plan to use a relationship building strategy in your classroom. So in the chat or at home, if you wanna pause, what strategy will you, use, will you use that you learn today in your classroom or how are you gonna plan to build a relationship? So we're gonna make a commitment um, if you want, you can use the sentence stem, I commit to doing blank um, with that strategy. And I'll give you just a minute to do that. And then we'll wrap up. If you want to use that sentence, then I commit to blank to build relationships in my classroom. If you don't want to, it's okay. But if it helps you. I know for myself, you got about three more seconds, but if I were still in the classroom, I think it would be, I commit to um, planning time and making relationships important. I think sometimes that I used to get wrapped up in like, the only thing I need to do is content, but relationships provide that foundation for content. They are important. And so um, when I started doing that, it totally changed my teaching. And for me as an educator, even now in my current role, there are things and goals that I set of how to build relationships with my coworkers, just because I know they make such a difference. Um, I love this one. I commit to using the SpongeBob graphic. I'm so glad that you found that helpful. Um, Yes, uh, I hope you're okay with sharing this comment. It says, I think we assume everyone walks 
in with our energy and where we're at, but sometimes their faces don't convey how they're truly feeling. Yeah. I think it gives them a space to talk and be how they really are. So thank you for that commitment and um, whatever you commit to doing, if you're watching this after, um, I hope that you found these impactful. I included some resources on the slides. Um, so if you want to check those out, there's a great um, TED talk. Um, there's curriculum maps that have these strategies in them. Um, love AVID's four stages of relational capacity. So how you can build those relationships and stages, great relationship building toolkit, um, an Edutopia article, and then that brain break prep list if you're thinking about those. Um, so just know that <laughs> that's there and available for you. Oh, I switched over to, I'm citing my sources here and I clicked on the link for that icon. Sorry about that. Um, just know that as you're thinking about relationships, I love this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. If you cannot do great things, you can do small things in a great way. And just planning one of these will really help you. So thanks for watching. Thanks for being here. Um, if you go to canyonsdistrict.org slash canyonsu slash bitesizepd, um, there's a link there that you can fill out for credit. Um, if you're watching this after, um, so that you can get credit for your time here today. Um, otherwise, that's all I have for you. Um, I love feedback. So if you have any comments about things I could do better or things that you enjoyed, you can either put them in the chat before you head out, or you're welcome to send me an email. Again, emma.moss at canyonsdistrict.org. And thanks so much for being here today. Loved having those that were able to attend and excited for those that watch after. So thank you so much and have a good night. If you're still here, I'm just going to go ahead and stop the recording. So, yeah.